Okay, students, here's a wonderful phrase, a wonderful concept to put into your verbal quiver. <laughs> it's the concept of a Pyrrhic victory. The Battle of Pyrrhic took place roughly 400 BCE between the Spartans and Athenians in ancient Greece. And the Spartans were victorious. But the Spartans were victorious at such a high cost that the battle was not worth winning. In other words, they emerged on the other side weaker than when the battle started. The reason I bring this up is because the Taiping Rebellion was a Pyrrhic victory for the Qing Dynasty. They emerged from the war with tremendous debt. They had to pay the Europeans for the supplies. They had to pay the Europeans war reparations for the First and Second Opium War. So they emerged from this war. And there was virtually no revenue because the economy was devastated by the war. So they were paying out mass amounts and receiving very little in terms of revenue. The war also devastated China agriculturally. So not only is there financial hardship in the form of debt, but there's also mass starvation that's occurring as a result of this war, which was truly a Pyrrhic victory. To deal with this financial crisis, the Qing Dynasty is going to do something that they didn't want to do. They are going to deputize local provincial leaders to become tax collectors and they are going to incentivize them to collect as much as they can with whatever methods they choose. Now this is going to increase revenue, but it's also going to empower these local leaders. And remember, one of the primary phenomenon in Chinese history are these cycles of strong central government and then strong provincial leaders. So this is going to encourage those provincial leaders to actually challenge the authority of the Qing. So here's an example of one of these local provincial leaders that seized upon this opportunity. His name is Zheng Guofang. And not only did he amass a personal wealth, but he did what a lot of provincial leaders did. He used foreign advisors as consultants on how to collect more and more revenue from the population. In exchange for this advice, these foreign powers strengthened their hold, strengthened their presence in China. The, the Qing government is going through a one-two punch here. Number one, the local provincial leaders are getting stronger, and number two, the foreign influence is growing. And now I have to introduce the most fascinating person of the unit, who's a female. Her name is Su Shi. And do you remember in The Last Emperor, the terrifying woman, in the opening scenes when she's addressing the little future king, that is Su Shi, the Empress Dowager. What's fascinating about her is she came to the Qing court as a concubine. A concubine is like a harem girl, although you're a little higher on the pecking order, but you're certainly not like a wife. So she becomes pregnant by the Qing Emperor and her son becomes the emperor when the old king dies. She acts as the regent to her young son. In other words, the young son makes decisions, but Su Shi is the one who is putting the ideas in his head. He passes away, and then her nephew <laughs> becomes the king. She does the same thing. And in the movie, you saw her still trying to exert her influence even though she's on her deathbed. She was in favor of two policies. One is decentralized power, which I explained a little earlier, but also she is convinced that China needs to industrialize. Unless China industrializes, the nation will be irrelevant. 